Tighten your tool belts and grab your long pork. We're doing Lonka this week and it's going to be a long one. Lonka is a very cool nation. It's one of two monkey nations in the early ages. Lonka is known as the land of demons and it has a lot of things going on. This is a nation that benefited from some of the changes from five to six and I feel it's in a pretty good place. It was I would consider it one of the stronger nations, although it does have some key weaknesses that definitely hold it back. Taking a look at the lore of Lonka, we can see here that Lonka is on a dark and densely forested island of Lonka. Rakshasa's demon ogres from an earlier era still linger. Gifted with tremendous strength, they once had fought the Devadas of Kalasa, but since then the most powerful of the Rakshasas have left the world for the nether realms. The remaining Rakshasas have captured and enslaved the monkey people of Kalasa and made them serve as warriors, hunters, or food. The Rakshasas had no use for the peaceful white ones and Kalamarakas. Rakshasa's half-breeds lead the monkey people of Lanka. Since the enslavement of the apes, the ancient conflict between the Devadas of Kailasa and the Rakshasas of Lanka have renewed. Rakshasas have an affinity for blood magic, and in times of strife, they are drawn to the blood of innocence. So this is a pretty dark nation. We're talking cannibal monkeys, sacrifices, death magic, blood magic. It, it is not a happy place in the lands of Lanka. As for national features, we are a race of demon ogres, apes and undead. We prefer heat scales of plus two. Our military consists of strong Rakshasan infantry, missile units, and light infantry, along with reanimated apes. And I would add in here summoned demons. Magic is air magic, blood magic, death, a little bit of glamour, and a little bit of nature. So an okay spread, and we're okay to decent at what we do. Uh, we have a lot of random pathing on one of our mages for a lot of those, but otherwise we are relatively consistent with what we can get. Our priests are medium powered. We have several holy twos that we can recruit and we have a summonable holy three. Our national priests can also reanimate the dead. A very powerful ability that we will look at. Our Dominion gives blood hunts, give more blood slaves in turmoil, and less in order. So we are strongly incentivized to go turmoil if we want blood hunting, and even more so because our scales and blesses increase our turmoil limit and our heat limit. In addition to that, we have several troops who have chaos power. So chaos power scales off of turmoil or unrest. So again, we are strongly incentivized to take turmoil. For buildings, we use the standard forts of the age, and we have no discounts on anything. Looking at our troops, we have a couple pretty distinct categories. We have two varieties of Mercadas. We have two varieties of Atavi. We have two varieties of Bandar. And we have several different uh, demon slash Bandar units. Starting out at the cheap end, we have our Mercada. We have two varieties, a relatively melee one and a short bow one. The melee one has a club with sticks and stones attack. This is a ranged attack that many of our monkeys have. It is interesting for the fact that it has 30 ammunition, but you throw two every time. It is a relatively inaccurate attack, and it is based off of our strength with a penalty on it. Uh, sticks and stones on some of your stronger troops can actually be surprisingly effective on your weaker troops, it's probably going to bounce off of most things. We also have this shortbow variety, notable for being a five gold shortbow. However, our Mercada are very weak, so it is a very weak shortbow and is not particularly accurate. These can help you blanket something with a lot of arrows, but they're no, not accurate or damaging, so of limited use here. Of more interest is the melee Mercada, who is size two. A lot of our infantry is size four, so we can have two of those in a square with two extra spots left. It is nice to get one of these into that square to just help soak up hits. Uh, it should be noted that all of our monkey troops are animals, and most of them have forest survival. The Mercada specifically are undisciplined, and we have the weakness of 
very bad magic resistance combined with bad morale. So these troops are you know, unscriptable, and they're not going to stick around once they start taking losses. These are definitely worthwhile, though, for eating a charge or just sticking out in front of your, fr your front line with a small group to let the enemy run up and kill them. And then hopefully your better troops behind will step up and get the first swing on more competent enemy troops. So something you'll recruit some of, but nothing to linchpin a strategy around. Next up, we have two versions of Atavi. We have both an archer and a very light infantry. The light infantry, again, has the sticks and stones attack. These ones, unfortunately, kind of fall into a weird spot where they're not as cheap as the Mercada, and they're not as good as the Bandar. Generally speaking, I would skip the Atavi completely. Uh, in a very heavy pinch, their short bow is quite a bit better than Mercada. But with 8 morale, they are not particularly good at that. It should be noted that they do have stealth, so you maybe could use these to do a little bit of stealthy uh, attacking or some raiding, but it's not particularly great stealth, and they're not particularly great units. So unless you are attacking something very weak, they will struggle to beat even most PD. Next up, we finally get to some good, or good units. We have Light Mandar Archers and the Bandar Warrior. The Light Mandar Archer is actually really good. This is a Bandar troop who are very strong. We have 15 strength. We have 18 HP, and we even have three natural protection. It should be noted that we are one of the only a handful of nations that have long bows in the early age. At range 45, with our high strengths giving us 16 damage and an okay precision, if not the best. These are pretty good troops. Their size makes it hard to get good buffing on them, but we don't really have a lot of good buffs to give them anyways. I quite like these troops. They, for the price of 16, this is a pretty killy bow. And we have plenty of things to stick in front of them and let them just sit in the back and fire away. And on the off chance that something does get in range, we have an 11 attack with a 21 on our uh, damage mace. So they can pop a few guys on the head if they get in melee. A very usable troop. Uh, what I would prefer to stick inside my forts often too. Next up, we have our medium infantry, I guess you'd call this guy, the Bandar Warrior, wielding a similar mace. He does sticks and stones. It should be noted that with his 15 strength, this is a range 15 sticks and stones. And while it's relatively inaccurate, you do throw two per round. So with enough of these guys, you can just kind of shower the enemy with projectiles. And with 12 blunt damage, especially things that aren't wearing helmets, you can get some damage in on these. Annoyingly though, a lot of times they will get a kill in melee. And then rather than charging into the next melee fight, they'll stop and throw a few sticks and stones, I guess, in celebration. However, at that point, I would much prefer that they would go in to melee combat and try to seal the deal. They are wearing a scale mail cuirass and use a buckler. These are pretty standard equipment for us on our troops who have equipment. No helmet, notably. But we do have a little bit, we have three natural protection, so they're not totally vulnerable. And they have 18 HP, so that's not bad. You can take two hits from like a human-sized troop. And the cost is nothing prohibitive, although you probably will not end up using too many of these just because we have so many other options. Next up, we have sacred units. I'm going to start with this guy, the Kola Muka Warrior. This is a recruit from any fort with a temple sacred, not cap only. That is what makes this guy quite, quite good. He is wearing our standard gear, but he actually is smart enough to put on a hat. So his protection is pretty darn good. 14 is considered heavy infantry by many nations in the early age. Uh, he's got four natural protection, plus the armor, giving him 18 on the head and 13 on the body. Very respectable. And okay defense at 12, a decent attack skill. He's at 13 with 26 damage on the falchion. So just as a normal unit, he's already able to fight. Now, no, he is size 4, so you're only going to have 2 attacks per square. So the attack density isn't great. However, 13 attack with 26 damage, you can hit people and kill people for sure. But he is sacred. So whatever 
blessing you take, he will get to partake in that. And we have tons and tons of good sacreds, so you're definitely going to be taking a, po a pretty solid blessing. And many of our sacreds share similar attributes, being heavy-hitting melee, so your blessing will probably transfer over to anything that you're using. Should be noted here that he is still an animal. He is 10 magic resist is standard human, so he's better than most of his compatriots. And he's a glutton. Glutton means you eat extra food compared to something else of your same size. While it's not too bad on this guy, once you start stacking up a lot of demons, the gluttony actually can start adding up. So just note how much supply an army is using, because it might surprise you how hungry they are, and you might have to take steps to provide supplies to your army. After that, we have three varieties of cap only. We have the Asara. The Asara has a javelin, and with his 20 strength, that is a very strong javelin. However, it is also very inaccurate. However, if you're hit by that javelin, 22 piercing damage is likely to do damage to anything that it hits. He is actually a full demon, whereas our previous guy we were looking at was not. As a demon, that gives him certain attributes, such as having perfect dark vision. He, however, is vulnerable to everything that could hit demons. Should be noted, he also still has Gluttony. As a troop with solid HP, very good strength, decent attack, he's very usable. Length 3 weapon means you probably won't be getting repelled. You're strong, so you can throw that Javelin pretty well. These guys are alright, and at 35 gold, uh, almost no resources, and an okay amount of recruitment, you may start the game off by recruiting these. The alternative to him would be the Anusara. The Anusara is like a donkey-headed demon. Uh, very similar to the previous guy, he only has 12 attack with a length 1 mace. He does 24 damage if he does hit, though. Still unarmored, but he is using a buckler. And he has Chaos Power. Should be mentioned that the Asara also has Chaos Power. Chaos Power means when we're fighting in turmoil, and or places with unrest, we get bonus stats. Those can make quite a difference on your unit. It adds strength, attack, and defense. So you can become quite a lot more powerful than what your card here would indicate if you were in a area with enough turmoil. Overall, uh, I think I prefer the javelins and the length three spears to the mace. The buckler's nice to have, but it's only a buckler. He's not wearing any other armor, so I generally tend towards using the Asura rather than the Anusara. If you have resources and money, though, you will probably want the Palankasha. The Palankasha is armored. He's wearing kind of our standard equipment. Still no helmet, unfortunately, but he does have five natural protection. He's a full demon with the Chaos Power. You'll see those traits on most of our units. And he has now a gotten two, so now we're using a lot more food than we were before. He wields a falchion at 13 attack with 27 damage, so very similar damage profile to things we've been seeing, and is sacred like the rest of them. I like these guys quite a bit. Their protection, 14 on the body, 5 on the head, but he is also wielding the buckler. Good troop, if I can afford them. This is usually what I pull out of my capital. You could try to use these in expansion if you're not having money problems. Troop-wise, I would call this a pretty good lineup. We have very cheap things, we have effective things, we have good sacreds. You're definitely going to want to consider your Bless, because this is a nation with a lot of sacred summons, a lot of sacred troops, including a Recruit Anywhere sacred, a lot of priests, a lot of priest mages, and some strong cap sacred priests. So while we look at these, keep that in mind that you have to take whatever stats you're seeing into account with a blessing of some sort. Moving on to commanders, we have the Mercata Scout. He's notable for being only 25 gold with 60 stealth, so not only cheap, but also very stealthy. He has mountain survival and forest survival, uh, he's an animal, but you're never going to bring these guys into combat on purpose. So having a very cheap scout is a good bonus, and he's a quite good scout. Next up, we have three varieties of leader. We have the Atavi Chieftain. His only notable attribute is he is stealthy. So if you want to try something with those Atavi troops, 
for stealth raiding, then he is your guy to do that. However, he only has 50 leadership and 10 morale. He is not particularly great. Uh, he is recruitment point one, so you could get two of these guys per turn. That's at least something, but otherwise I would not use this guy. Next up, we have two varieties of Bandar leaders. The Bandar commander is usually my go-to. He's only 105 gold and one recruitment point. He has 100 leadership, so we can do formations. And 14 morale is very good. Using our standard falchion and our standard equipment, he is just kind of a workhorse. He is generally what I get if I need to move normal troops around. However, if you can afford it, the Bandaraja is a better version. He trades out the Buckler for a two-handed Battle Axe, which is quite damaging at a good attack. He goes up to 150 leadership, so you're looking at plus two for four squads. However, you're paying for that by going up to two recruitment points and costing 160 gold. Overall, I very much like this guy. I think both of them are good and usable. Next up, we look at priests and mages. Our Rektapata is a Holy One, Blood One priest. He has a fist, so he's unarmed. He is wearing a cap, however, no other armor. They do have their three natural protection. It should be noted that all of our priests are reanimator priests, meaning that you can choose to summon in ghouls soulless, and long dead. Your efficiency at doing that is based on what level of holy you are, so this is our least efficient, however also our cheapest chassis to do it. They are 110 gold for 7 research with an upkeep of 44, so our more efficient researcher, although very low. You will end up using these guys to ferry around undead, maybe patrol with undead if you have nothing else to lead them with. They can do some blood stuff, these guys can go into sabbaths to boost other casters. You will get some of these. They are decent. Next up, I'm going to look at our other sacred priest, the Kola Muka. This is a blood holy two with a random of death, nature, or blood. Very notable here. This is how you get your blood twos. Blood two plus a sanguine dousing rod at construction five is the most efficient blood hunters. Uh, excluding things that have other bonuses to it. So you're going to be fishing for blood twos to be your blood hunters, but even your other path ones have things that they can do. Different summons, different spells. They're not great mages, but that's not really their job. Being holy two means we're more efficient at blessing. We're going to have a ton of sacred troops to bless and very rare holy three access. You could put this guy into a sabbath and make him a holy three, that is actually something you may want to consider. It's very micro-intensive moving that many blood slaves around because you're going to need one for him and one for each slave. So you're going to spend three blood slaves per fight no matter what. But sometimes it's just very difficult to bless all of your sacred troops and that makes it guaranteed. As a researcher, he does nine research for 240 gold with an upkeep of 96. So not the most efficient, but he can do it. He also is a reanimator priest, remembering that you're more efficient the higher your holy is. Oftentimes, the non-blood two ones, I tend to like to have them run around doing soulless summoning to create units that will be on my patrol units. The long dead are better than the soulless, however, the difference for patrolling is not that high. So they're also good at moving those troops around. They have 50 undead leadership, 10 magic leadership. Should be noted that undead leadership is also for demons. So this will probably be one of the troops that you'll be using to move demons around. Whereas our previous commanders did not have undead leadership. And they're not sacred, so we can't give it to them. So without items, you're going to have to use one of these guys to be moving demons around. Finally, we have the Yogini. This is a non-sacred mage and the best of our non-cap mages. He is death one, nature two, blood one. Uh, a rather mediocre mage, unfortunately. You will still probably get him because he is 13 research for 210 with a 168 yearly upkeep. Then you can throw him into a Sabbath to do some bigger spells, but he's not the best. However, he does have good undead leadership. He also can move around magic troops and a little bit of normal troops. 
again, you'll get some of these. They will be useful. They could search for your Nature 2 sites. Moving up to our cap only mages, we have two. We have the Rakshasi. The Rakshasi is a very strong mage, however, with a lot of random paths. So she comes in guaranteed Death 1, Nature 1, Glamour 1, Blood 1, Holy 1. And we get two 100% rolls that are not linked of Death, Nature, Glamour, Blood. This is a mage that benefited from the split of Air and Glamour. She used to have Air, but wasn't as good at it as our other choice. So by giving her Glamour, that gives her something that is actually useful. But it's going to be very random. Uh, if you did roll into a level 3 of any of these things, they would be great to site search, run rituals, cast specific spells for you. You're probably going to need quite a few of these because you're going to be fishing for certain pathing options. And they're decent. They have the susceptibility to fire, meaning that you want to keep fire damage away from them. And we like it very hot, so unfortunately we're not going to be able to hide with cold to lower the effectiveness of fire spells. She is also a shapeshifter. She has seduction in her other form and is stealthy. Seduction is a different type of assassination where you try to get them to join you, and if you fail, you might have to kill them. As a seducer, she's pretty strong. This pathing gives you possibly swarm access, illusionary troop access, skeleton spam, many ways to kill things. However, a, a premium of a, a 425 gold plus slow to recruit, you're probably not going to throw too many of these way, away as assassins. But maybe you get lucky and you pull a key commander or a mage that gives you some good pathing. Could be useful. She is a high glutton eight, so she's eating like enough food for I believe 12 human troops in total. Again, keep an eye on your supply consumption with these armies. Has the chaos power and is a reanimator priest. I would not use these for re reanimating since they're only holy one and they have many other things they could be doing. They can research, they can cast rituals, be our battlefield magic, etc. Note, she does have no gear, so some gear would definitely make her a little more survivable if you're worried about that. Our other capital-only mage is the Raksharaja. The Raksharaja is thug material. He comes in with air 2, death 1, blood 2, holy 2, and a random air, death, blood. If you get air 3, you can easily, well, if you can afford it, you can boost up to 4 and make boosters for your other guys. Air 2 also gives you mist form, cloud trapeze, lightning bolt, lots of good spells there. This guy's uh, gear is also pretty good. He gets two different attacks with Gore and a, the Falchion, and he's even better at it than most of our troops. He's wearing our standard gear, minus a hat. If I was going to give him a hat, I would probably look at our national item, uh, which will allow him to come into battle with a summoned buffalo. So definitely could do some thugging with 36 HP. That's not terrible. He's not slow to recruit, and he's got okay pathing for a thug. These guys are very acceptable. They are, however, very pricey at 550 gold. So your capital, is, you're really going to want to be on your cap mages, one or the other type. And you're going to feel those prices because we don't have efficient research. We have blood hunting to do. We have undead summoning to do. We have sight searching to do. I never feel like I have enough mages as Lanka. And woe be you if you start taking mage losses because you're going to really feel that pinch. As for who we would want to prophetize, it's a difficult one. We don't have any Holy 3s until very late in the game from a summons, so we're not going to be able to go up to Holy 4 on anybody. I think you could make the argument for one of your capital-only mages just to knock off their upkeep. However, they have other mage things to do, and if you have a Holy 3, you kind of want them to do Holy 3 things. So I tend to move more towards one of these two commanders, this guy is pretty terrifying as a prophet. However, he doesn't have the buckler, so I tend to actually move towards this guy. He's got armor, he's got a buckler, he has 23 HP, so he's not just going to get squished. He can protect himself in melee if he has to. His magic resist is rather low, so that is a point of worry, but it's no better or worse than the other option. So I tend to go with one of those two. 
but you could make the argument that maybe one of your expensive mages, maybe even this guy, he's not sacred and his upkeep is rather high. But again, like he has other things he could be doing rather than holy spells and we can do holy twos. So I, I, I lean towards the commanders. For sites, we have Sri Prada. This gives us our cap only mages, three death gems and a air gem. We also have Lanka, which gives us our cap only demon sacreds and two more nature. So three death, two nature and an air is very good income, all usable natively by us. We have, uh, as we'll see here shortly, some national nature spells, national death spells, and we can use the air gems um, either to do some corpse constructs or for cloud trapeze, plenty of, plenty of good things to do with that. Next up, I'm going to look at the hero. We only get one, the Apostate Raja. This is kind of the guy that caused the schism within the monkeys and led his rebellion into the arms of the Rakshasa, who basically were like, hey, thanks, why don't you come to dinner? And then they ate him and then resurrected his corpse. So yeah, that didn't work out too well for him. He's not particularly notable, only has 15 HP, which is unfortunate, but he has high magic resist for an undead. He is uh, priest level two, so he can do the reanimating. He has a very high undead leadership. He's your best undead leader. I tend to use him in that role, but he does have fear. So I don't know, maybe you could deck him out with some gear. He does come with this implementor axe, which is amazing. In this test game, uh, Baratos' Moloch god jumped onto this guy on like turn two and he went chop chop and Moloch was no more. So very nice weapon here with the magic damage, very high, good attack, okay length. Otherwise not particularly notable. Next up we will look at our national items. As for national items, we have one. It is this headdress. And the headdress is actually pretty good. We have lots of troops who don't have head armor, so they'd appreciate something. At five nature gems, it's not too expensive. And it brings in a buffalo, which I actually quite like the buffalo chassis. So I think this is a decent item. It is construction five, but we're going to, want to go to construction five for Sanguine dousing rods for skull mentors for amulets of the dead. So we're we're going to construction five at some point and probably relatively early because of sanguine dousing rods. So I think you could do worse than that headdress for using nature gems. As for summons, we have all the summons. As you can see here, we have a huge variety. I'm going to start with the ones from our conjuration, starting with Ghana's. These are actually sneakily very, very good. At first glance, it's like, okay, undead with 10 HP, uh, only 12 magic resist. Oh, eh, that's kind of whatever, 10, 10 attack with 14 damage. It is magic and it is spectral, meaning they can magic save for half damage. However, they're ethereal. That means that 75% of attacks that hit them that are not magic just don't do anything. These guys are actually amazing. And the... Summon spell gives us 20 plus plus for nine, de for nine death gems, and it only requires a death one mage to do. The plus plus means that for every death above one, we get two additional ones for free. This is a very efficient spell, and two casts of this, uh, along with the, your army, are great. Fighting, let's say, barbarians, You'll lose some of these, but 75% of those barbarian attacks will just do nothing. This is a very solid unit. Very solid. I quite like these. I think it's very doable to rush for Conjuration 2 and use these guys to help bolster up some of your otherwise lackluster expansion. Very good spell. At Conjuration 3, we have several spells. We can conjure tigers. They're normal tigers. They're animals. They use nature gems. I'm not impressed. We have elephants. They are normal elephants. I am not impressed. Uh, definitely have better things to do than that. And we have buffalo. I actually do like the buffalo. They are a size 6 with trample, but they have berserk. So once they go berserk, they will not retreat into your own troops as they run away. So 
I actually like these ones. If I'm going to spend nature gems on summons, this is where I would spend it. You get five plus and it requires a nature two, so you can do it natively. Only costs eight gems for five. I feel like that's okay. That's fine. These guys are doable. It's nice to have some trampler uh, options. We would struggle with things like elves possibly. Although we do have lots of, of uh, magic weapons on our summons, so it's not as desperate as, say, Baratos was. Our final conjuration unit is the Vitalas. The Vitalas are the possessed corpses. These guys. Again, at first glance, they don't look particularly good. Like, they're kind of standard undead. They are pretty have a pretty good attack. They are armored. They have a buckler. Pretty good HP for an undead. These actually have a second spirit form, though. That is ethereal. Not, I would say, probably as good as the Ghanas. But having a second form is very nice. If they don't get killed, they can come back. It is ethereal, so it can buy you some more time. However, at Contration 5, that's hard to justify. You have so many other magic paths you need. I would struggle to justify going up to 5 for these, especially when the Ghanas fill a similar role for a similar price and do it pretty well. They also have the magic weapon, whereas these are not magic weapons. Yeah, I would stick to the Ghana, I think, over these. Next up, we are moving over to Blood, and we have our Rekshasa. I like these quite a bit, actually. They have a lot of HP at 28. You're going to get three of them per summon, and it only costs eight Blood Slaves and only a Blood 1 Mage to cast. So right from the get-go, you could be popping a few of these out. They have the standard demon traits, including the Chaos Power and Dark Vision. They are susceptible to fire, but they're sacred, and they have two attacks, and just naked standing here with no other bonuses from Chaos Power or a Bless. Two attacks at 13 with 19 damage behind them is very solid. A decent amount of HP, a little bit of natural protection, decent magic resist. I quite like these. I think that popping a few of these out to add to your expansion parties or your armies is totally fine, uh, for the, especially for the cheap, cheap price. Next up, we have the Feast of Flesh. That summons in our Pragyasha. I do not like these. Uh, now we've moved up to Blood 2, so this is more research than the Rakshasa. You have to have 50 blood slaves. Now, you do get 18 of these guys. However, only one attack at no better than any of our other troops could already do. They have the same essential traits that everyone else has. They're high, high gluttony. I am less impressed with these. The cap only guys are about the same, frankly. And saving up to 50 just for some ch essentially chaff demons? Like, strong ones, but still, I I would save. I wouldn't spend on these ones. The Asrapa, these are pretty decent. You do get several of them per summon. You get three of these for eight. So these are probably an upgrade to the normal Rakshasa. They have a kick attack, and they have the Afame, which is kind of a special magic weapon that we have on some of our troops. It's magic damage, and it has life drain, so you can help heal yourself up with this. These have Berserk 3, and they have Chaos Power. So these kind of mediocre stats actually are quite a bit better um, than they may otherwise look, especially when you've got Turmoil 3 behind them. I think these guys are perfectly fine. Um, I would probably upgrade to these over the normal Rakshasa when I get there. They do have less HP, they do have less protection, but they can heal themselves. It's kind of a hero there thing for these ones. Next up we have Rakshasa Warriors. These guys are actually pretty good. They trade in an attack for this Iron Cudgel, a length 2, 13 attack, 33 damage. And again, that's just baseline. They have Chaos Power, so really that's probably going to be 36, 37 damage. So they will just mince things that they hit with this. And they are armored, so our protection is pretty good. No hat, unfortunately. Decent amount of HP, very strong. I like these guys. They have four siege strength each, so that is something kind of notable. A lot of our guys have that high strength, so we're good at sieging, but yeah, these guys are totally fine. They're expensive, though. You're going to be looking at 21 blood slaves for five. Definitely not cheap 
Next up, we have the Sanhaibala. The Sanhaibala are pretty interesting, if a bit niche. These guys have dark power in addition to their chaos power. They are wearing better armor than a lot of our guys have. And they wield a moon blade, and a special one because it's one-handed. This thing gives us anti-magic damage on hit, 10 armor negating damage versus magic beings. So a little, like, very specific where you might want to use these guys. But if you're in that situation, these guys would absolutely destroy magic beings. Otherwise, I don't think these are particularly notable compared to some of our other options. Unfortunately, because they look, they look cool. Next up, we have the Zakini. These are quite interesting. These are interesting thug chassis. They have... Air Magic 3, Death 1, Blood 3, Holy 2. They have Damage Reversal. This is a very strong ability. It is essentially, if you would deal damage to me, if you fail your save, you take the damage instead. So an upgraded Blood Vengeance, essentially, because you don't have to take the damage. So very powerful on that. They have Chaos Power, like many of our things do. They have Actual Fear, and they can fly. Blood... Uh, with the trapeze, you could trapeze into places. Quite good. They have two attacks, the kick and the athime weapon, which I quite like for the uh, life drain that it has. The skull necklace is notable for having head and body protection. So he's not naked or anything. Quite good, quite good. Um, these, they're expensive though. Like, you're definitely paying for all that. This is... 81 Blood Slaves for one of those, and it's hard to cast because it's Blood 4, Air 1. But if you're in need of a thug that is very good, that could be the answer to that. Next up, we have the Salmon Ishada. The Salmon Ishada are very cool. These are summonable demon assassins. They have Chaos Power and Dark Power. Note that even in normal fight things for assassinations, there's a chance that it happens at night. So that's just some more free stats for you. They have a Moonblade and a Dusk Dagger, both magic. The Dusk Dagger uh, gives you draw blood, so draw blood's not very resisted. Good way to kill things. Very strong, however, this thing doesn't come in until Blood 6. And I don't know how many of these you would get. Like, if you're all the way to Blood 6, how many... Blood Slaves at 35 a pop. Let's say you needed four or five of these guys to really make an impact. I don't know. I don't know. But they're very cool. Um, totally usable. Maybe throw that uh, buffalo headdress on them so they have a buffalo to go with them to assassination attempts. Very strong for that. Very strong. They will probably get quite a few kills for you. Next up, we have the Denava. The Denava are cool. Look at that guy. <laughs> very cool. Uh, Four arms, wielding three different weapons, plus a buckler, no hat, 92 HP, sacred, he's got fear. This is a almost super combatant level troop. However, to get this, you are definitely going to be paying for it. It is a blood five ritual, and you need 70 blood slaves for three of these. So if you are kind of getting to the, I don't know what you'd call it, luxury stage of summoning, a lot of the previous guys we were just looking at, why would you get them and not three of these? Like, this is going to be really tough for people to kill because you're, these are not just thugs. These are just troops. So if you had three or six or nine of these in an army, in addition to all the other stuff you've got, it would be quite, quite hard to finish these off with 92 HP and 18 magic resist. A very, very cool unit. Gift of Reason target, I would think. This guy, I mean, he's basically a super combatant. And he is sacred, so he's going to get your blessing. Very cool, but again, he comes very, very late into the game. We also have the Dacia. This is, again, very cool. You get three of these per summon. They've got a Plague Bow, which is pretty interesting. It gives things disease on hit. They're very precise. But again, like, uh, how many of these are you going to summon in? They cost 45 Blood Slaves. You get three of them. Do you think... 12 of these would change the course of a battle with a bow? I, I don't know. I don't know on that one. I think you'd be better off with the melee ones than these guys. But again, very cool. Like, you can't, you can't deny that Wonka does not have cool demon summons. And finally, we have the Mendeha, the crowning jewel. 
This boy is not cheap at all. He comes in at 133 required blood slaves with the ritual costing five blood and two death. However, very, very strong. Three, uh, three air magic, three death magic, two blood, three holy. So this is your holy three we were speaking about earlier. Very nice for getting just all these demons that we've looked at blessed. Because you're going to be running around with a billion of them. And it's very hard to bless them, actually. He also doesn't have an icon here. But he automatically casts darkness at the beginning of battle. So you will start every fight in the dark. And running around with demons and undead, you literally don't care if it's dark. You quite like it. So very strong there. Has fear. Has a sleep aura. So he will just literally put people to sleep. So less of a chance that you just get surrounded and hacked down because everyone will fall asleep and then you'll hit them with your flesh eater for like 50 damage and it gives you a chest wound if you survive somehow. Very strong. He does have some downsides. He causes some unrest, but frankly, five is nothing. And he spreads laziness, so he will knock your scales further into sloth. But we don't really care about that. Is a reanimator priest, but what are you doing wasting this guy reanimating undead? Has 240 undead leadership, so very, very strong leader for that. This is definitely a crowning jewel and a strong argument to go all the way to death eight. And even though he costs 133, I don't feel like that's overpriced. I mean, if all he did was give you the holy three, I'd pay it. If all he did was give you the free darkness, I'd pay it. Uh, and he still can cast spells quite good spells. This could do Rigor Mortis, uh, Cloud Warriors, uh, bi other big death things. Very, very strong. He will not be sad by getting these guys. You could replace his helm and his armor with something better. So 15 protection could definitely be pushed higher. He has full slots, is flying. So exceedingly strong unit here. Definitely super combatant territory. So pulling all that together, you are a nation of demons you really like demons you really like blood hunting you have the ability to summon up undead in quite large numbers most of it's kind of garbage units that you're going to use to patrol but the normal long dead you can summon also include monkey undead which can be your geared troops so you actually can get some undead wearing armor with a decent weapon and it's not super uncommon to have that be the case so very strong the weakness here is you're getting pulled in a lot of different directions, and you need mages to do most of your good stuff. Like, these troops are not going to win you the game. Like, you have good longbows, that's not a game-winning unit. You have good medium troops, well, medium good medium troops. But still, not going to win you the game. You have some cheap utility units, not going to win the game. Your recruit anywhere sacred, well, good probably not going to win you the game. You have decent magic path access to what you can do, but it's not like super high. It's not like, okay, I just, I, I rush towards hordes of skeletons and I win. We can do that, but we already can do undead. Like we already, that that's something we have covered and we don't have to waste combat turns making undead. We could do something else like throw some shadow bolts or something. We have a little bit of air magic, but not great. We might be interested in putting up storm if we're not using our own archers just to protect ourselves. And we could storm power. Every one of these guys could be a thunder striker with storm power up. That means we're going to need lots of forts because we need income. Lots of temples and labs because we need to re be recruiting lots and lots of mages. Go out blood hunting, to go out sight searching, to lead demons, to raise undead, to move undead. All of those things cost a lot. And our cheapest guy here is 110 and he's he definitely shows his cheapness. So we we like money, but our scales are leaning towards not being good for money. We have tons and tons of demons who are very strong. However, the things that counter demons counter them very strongly. So you're looking at getting out of the early game where you're the weakest and really pushing the mid game where you are the strongest before anti undead slash anti demon spells come online. If you can get a little bit of a lead, you can definitely snowball hard. We have very strong blood hunters and very strong summons to spin those on. All of our troops, all of our summons are very killy. 
and they're okay at surviving. Generally speaking, the Bless will make or break a lot of these units. In this game, I had some trouble expanding. It was rather difficult. On turn one, Barato sailed my capital and I wiped them out, which was quite lucky, actually. So that really helped me out because I was able to take out Baratos relatively early in the game. And that kind of kept me going. I got lucky that Ermor just kind of established a natural border with me. Closer than I would have liked, but I was okay with that because I was already stuck in a war with Baratos. And once I overcame that early game, I got some blood hunting centers up. And I really just skyrocketed. I'm running around with about three of these armies that are just full of Ghana. They're full of demon troops and full of longbows. And I'm just wrecking all the AI armies. Once I kind of broke their main death balls, nothing they've been able to send at me has been able to touch me at the moment. For the initial expansion, though, your starting army is garbage. It's made up of like these, the Atava and some, I think they're the bow ones maybe, Mercada. They are absolute garbage. I was happy to expand into a wasteland even though it has hardly any resources and any income, it was something I could take on turn two. Whereas I, w I had to wait another couple turns to get a few demons to be able to take my other areas. Uh, also note that your cap only demons require demon leadership. So you're gonna need one of these guys to be leading them, not one of your normal leaders. And even if you make one a prophet, that does not automatically let him lead them. You would have to take that in your blessing. And I do think that that would be super useful, but you want stats on your demons. You want stats on your Recruit Anywhere Sacred. You want stats on your Sacred Mages and your Cap Only Mages and your Thug Units. So I don't know if you'd have the points to spare to pick up Undead Leadership. It would be, it would be hard for me to justify. As for chassis choices, we are relatively limited, although not horrifically so. We're not Atlantis. We have the Eastern gods, the kind of Indian gods, a good variety of them. We have several monkey nation gods. We have a Rakshasrini. We have a Nagasida. We have a Mararashi. All interesting. Uh, remember that your turmoil scales here will not stack with your nation ones. I'm not in love with any of those chassis. You have some Awake Expander types, um, some different Titan types. I think mostly the choice of your god for this nation is really going to come down to what you want for your blessing. You would, you could definitely make use of an Awake Expander. However, that's going to come at the cost of other points that could be spent on a stronger bless or better scales. Most of our summons and our sacreds already are decently killy. Some of them have more attacks than others, but nobody in there just is a wet noodle. Like, they're going to get kills even without your bless. So I tend to lean towards utility type things and things that keep me alive for blesses. So quickness, different defensive things, like be pretty good to get awe, be pretty good to get fear. Tons of things there. We have a lot of high HP units, so region is pretty strong. We're all demons, so we would appreciate extra magic resistance, whether from astral or from enchanted blood. Plenty of different ways to go here, and I think you could come up with lots of interesting blesses. The one I've mostly enjoyed, and probably what I will play, is just a blood fountain. And the blood fountain went for blood vengeance. I believe this is what he was. He has regeneration. He has Blood Vengeance, and I think I took like one point of HP. And because we are Lanka, we like Turmoil. We don't need uh, production, so we can go Sloth. We went Hot. I, growth, I do feel, is rather needed. With the amount of Blood Hunting we want to do, that's going to be useful to keep the pop up a little longer. We're also going to kill off a lot of pop by patrolling down the unrest. And we're going to have high, high turmoil. Since we're going super high turmoil, I do like to take a little bit of fortune to try to edge it towards at least not having too many bad events. And to pay for that, I took a little bit of drain. We There could be an argument to be made 
for going for two gra grain. This chassis has a magic scale, so it unfortunately I can't go for two grain. Two drain would make our research even worse, which is bad, but it would give us plus one magic resistance, which would be very useful for our junkie undead plus our good demons. We would like to have some extra magic resistance. And while we do have some spells we can cast that are magic resist, we're not dependent on that. So I feel like that would be totally fine. I would caution people going for magic two because that would reduce your magic resist by one in your own area. And you're already so bad at that. That could be quite painful. Like magic resist seven troops is just asking to get wiped out by something or mind controlled. This guy, he's awake. He gives regen and blood vengeance. For anyone who doesn't know, if somebody takes damage and has blood vengeance, they have the attacker has to make a magic resist roll or they take a hit of damage. This is quite good for killing off priests, which are trying to banish your demons or mages that are hitting your demons for something, or even just archers. I had lots of fights where they would pepper my unarmored demons and they would just kill themselves on blood vengeance while my demons regened the arrow damage. So I do quite like that. It makes it very painful. In multiplayer, it makes your opponent just second guess themselves and maybe not commit mages when they really should. And in a troop battle, our demons will probably kill most things they run up against. It's the magic that is our weak point. And this is just a psychological way of pushing people away from hitting you with magic. Because while it's probably the right thing to do, nobody likes losing mages. So yeah, very strong there. For the regen, I like that more than the enchanted blood because we do have very high HP things. Some of those really high end summons might be regening 10 HP around. And even our little dudes are probably getting three or four. So very strong to have regen on those units. We have lots of sacred mages. We have sacred mages that can get into Sabbath, so we could turbo communion, where you have very few slaves uh, supporting and they're using regen to keep themselves alive as they take the fatigue damage from your casters. So I quite like this bless. I will probably run something like this for the stream. That being said though, don't feel like that's the only way to play. I think you have plenty of options here. Uh, I do think that a, a strong expander could be quite, quite good. Get yourself an early fort and you have a second place to get mages. You have a second place to get your recruit anywhere sacreds. It could be very strong, but you need to find a way to afford that because you also, you need at least a little bit of scales. Like you could come down from where I'm at on this one. Like maybe you go with this guy. He has 25 in vulnerability. So that's that's the softish spot where I want to be for expanders. Maybe you go like, I don't know, he'd have to go like awe and regen and I don't know, he'd have to dump a little bit of scales to afford that because you're going to probably want domain dominion five or six. But I think that could totally, totally work. Uh, this is a fine unit. You could give him a hat. He has some slots, has good fear, has invulnerability. Most indies are not going to have anything that can get around that. And even if they do, he has 13 natural protection. So it's not the worst thing ever. Could be good there. You could fall back to the good old Earth Serpent with hard skin. That could work. Uh, you have lots of undead, so maybe the Draco Lich. You could fly in and breathe poison on your undead that don't care. That could be kind of cool. We're already going Sloth and Turmoil, so the dragons aren't really going to be a penalty. Maybe take one of those to flavor. Um, just a cheap regen bless, maybe. Or quickness bless. Could be interesting. Uh, you could go something like Vampiric Weapons. Go something really crazy with one of the cheaper, like maybe the uh, Demi Lich here. We have the crazy idol, elephant idol, uh, kind of a meme, but a funny one nonetheless. So <laughs> could be something to do there. Lots and lots of options here. The the Titans are pretty good too. Like this guy has Fortune Bringer. So you'd get extra uh, luck events in the capital where he's probably sitting and researching. He ups your luck scale. So maybe you go high turmoil, high luck, and maybe a little bit of magic scales and try to run your economy off of that. Power of Death, maybe you do something crazy with like some death scales. I, I don't know about that on this nation, but it's there. Lots of these ones are really cool. They have lots of arms so they can wear extra gear. 
I think it really comes down to, do you need an awake expander or can you get away without it? And how much blessing can you get away with? Because you would sure like to take a very, very large bless. So overall, Wonka, very strong. Many things we're good at, but we're going to be spread very thin for our mages. We have expensive things to recruit. We need lots of infrastructure. We have tons of mages that are decent, but we're going to need to support blood hunting, site searching, demon leadership, undead leadership. They're going to be busy, busy boys. And we're a nation, I think, that really appreciates lots and lots of conjuration or enchantment summoning in units so we can change gems into upkeep free units or leadership or research or a nation that needs construction five we have several things we get out of that we have the sanguine gaussing rod we have the skull mentor which will help bolster up our lackluster research we have the amulet of the dead which gives you a bonus to both summoning long dead from the ritual but also from our reanimator priests. A holy two unit with one of those equipped can churn out a pretty decent amount of long dead. And as noted, we get special long dead that are better than normal. Construction five is in your future. It's just a matter of how much do you need to protect yourself to get there. You also could go with some early blood, go up to the uh, demon power and, and get some extra strength on most of your troops. For a relatively cheap price you have native access to blood blood fecundity which is very strong for boosting your growth scales we have good blood hunters so you could totally get that up and keep that up in most of your forts keep that population up while you're hunting it down lots and lots of powerful uh blood spells blood nature we have the cross path we have some thugs we have some super combatants we have everything however we have distinct weaknesses in being lots of undead and lots of demons. Money is going to be a problem. If we don't win before we blood hunt things to the ground, we're going to have problems. We have lots of ways to spin gems, but we definitely need those things. So we're going to be popping those out all the time. We do not have very good paths for buffing. Nature is okay, but we're already fire susceptible. And adding bark skin helps some units more than others, but it adds more fire vulnerability. Maybe that's something you want to patch up on your bless. We don't have access to earth, so we don't have any of the good earth buffs. We don't have the water buffs. We can do a bit of the air stuff, so the uh, mist warriors is something we would definitely like. So a good nation that needs to start winning and keep winning. This is not a comeback nation. Um, you do not want to fall too far behind because you will really struggle to catch back up if you're losing just stacks and stacks of demons that are not cheap to be producing. Conversely, though, if you can get the ball rolling, you can snowball pretty dang hard on this nation. So I am very curious to see how other people like to make their pretenders here. I feel like there's so many options for so many cool blesses, for some cool awake expanders, for some relatively unused chassis that might be interesting, titans that can do cool things, some of the relatively unique ones that we don't get to see very often, the elephant idol, some of these Indian type idol, or excuse me, titans. Very, very cool stuff. So let me know down below what your thoughts are on that. I am looking forward to this stream. I feel like this is going to be a doozy, probably going to be our best stream yet i'm feeling it's a nation that people have been looking forward to it's a nation that's very cool and i think that if we can keep the micro under control it'll be a fun watch because those fights are wild with those demons leave your comments down below builders i hope you enjoyed your long pork sandwiches and i will see you on stream